that one of the essentials of being able to be a Christian is to have an honest and good heart. That passage tells us that the word, which verse 11 says is the seed of the kingdom, when it is sown in that heart, when people are taught that word, that it is the heart, the inward man, the mind, the intellect, ration, so on, rational, now rational part of man. To receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word which is able to save your soul, as James said it. That that heart is the one that will bring forth fruit. Without an honest and good heart, it doesn't make any difference how good the preacher is and his knowledge of the truth, his ability to present it, the life that he leads, or anybody else you're around. If you as an individual, if you do not have an honest and good heart, and only you can be sure you do, God knows, but God's not going to work a miracle when you don't want anything to be a certain way but won't do what's necessary to change it. He's not going to change it. It's your responsibility and my responsibility to make sure that you have an honest and good heart. So today I want to talk about being honest with ourselves. Being honest with ourselves. You may say, well, that's not that hard. Uh, well, really? Sometimes things are much more difficult for various reasons. And note that, for various reasons than they appear to be. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 5, But with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Notice, or of man's judgment. Yea, or yes, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing of myself, and yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall every man have praise of God. There was an inscription on the old Apollo or temple of Apollo in Delphi. Thus is coming from pagans who know not the God of the Bible. And yet that inscription read, Know thyself. Even the pagan understood, being a human being, that he could know himself. And yet what an assignment that is. Nowhere is accurate knowledge of ourselves more important than in our relationship to God and His will as is made clear in so many places and to this audience for the most part if not all, all mature enough to understand what I'm saying, then surely that's an important thing to keep in mind in view of the brevity and uncertainty of life. The psalm is penned in Psalm 26, 2. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. And Paul penned in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink that cup concerning proper observance of the Lord's Supper. supper. And then in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Well, now, these scriptures clearly teach us that we can know ourselves. We can know ourselves to the point of knowing whether we were pleasing to God or not. How would a person ever know they need to obey the gospel if they couldn't come to that conclusion? How would a member of the church who sinned uh, recognize that he has or she has and know what to do about it if they couldn't know themselves to a degree? But notice I come back again to Luke 8, 15. Only if, only if we are honest and objective in our evaluation of ourselves. Honest and objective. Ob in our evaluation of ourselves. 
Last night in Jeff's comments at the devotional, he gave several passages from Proverbs. And I think particularly of Proverbs 20 and verse 24 concerning the matter of knowing oneself and God's knowing us. If you don't watch out, you'll read all these verses I've given this morning. And you'll say, but well, you can't know yourself, but you can know yourself. Well, it becomes obviously the context must be taken into consideration. The literary environment in which a word is in colors it. It keeps its root meaning, but it colors it. Well, let's just simply go further with this. You know that the gospel requires repentance. And repentance requires a conscience. Luke 13, 3, Acts 17, 19, that's what was pricked and is mentioned in Acts 2, 37. After the people on Pentecost heard the gospel preached and received it honestly, by the way. Conscience involves self-knowledge. The word con-science. Conscience is related to conscious. Conscious. It literally means to know, to know with ourselves to know ourselves now all of that said you'll never become a Christian unless to at least to a degree you can know yourself recognize that you're lost in sin and know what God says do about it so your sins can be forgiven and you be reconciled to God I think the most dangerous person as to any one of us going to heaven would be probably ourselves have you ever noticed how many times Jesus said be not deceived now whose responsibility is it not to be deceived whose responsibility is not to believe a lie well you say what about the fellow that tells a lie what about that kind of person that's not what the Lord's saying Lord saying you have a personal responsibility to yourself not to lie to yourself or to believe lies anybody else tell. Which means I have to be conscious, there's a word, of what's going on. Because I have a conscience that ought to be pricked by the truth and moved by the truth and in the light of the truth see what I've done that's wrong and also, of course, how to know when you're right. Now, with this study, let's now begin to notice the advantage we have in knowing ourselves. In one sense, we each know ourselves best. Others know our thoughts, our motives, and values only as we reveal them. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. Paul talks about God being, the Holy Spirit being the rightful one to reveal the mind of God because He is God. And then we'll say, now what man knoweth the spirit of a man? Say, uh, uh, say the spirit of man that's in him. In other words, you're the only one that can really reveal yourself. So the information upon which others judge us is at best incomplete and often inaccurate. However, we can know others to an extent. Jesus talks about in Matthew 7 and verse 20, By their fruit ye shall know them. That doesn't mean you know all about them. It means by their actions, that action is, is either authorized by the Scriptures or it's not. So we can't know all there is about somebody else unless that somebody else is willing to pour it all out and I guarantee you're not willing to do that but the thing about it is it becomes a tool for the devil if we're not exceedingly careful and that's the reason Luke 8 15 is the passage I started with Next of all, I want to notice the disadvantage we have in knowing ourselves. 
It's the case that we are sometimes the poorest ones to objectively examine ourselves. But if we're not honest, and we keep coming back to that, don't we? We will not accept the evidence of what we are regardless of what we learn about ourselves. Because we have this great ability to lie to ourselves and to rationalize the things that we do when they're contrary to God's will to say, I'm a fine specimen before God. The Lord spent a great deal of time in His earthly ministry referring to the Pharisees and using just such uh, attitudes that they displayed all the time to say, you can't be like that. Remember the Pharisee that pretty well said, aren't you glad to have me? Aren't you glad I'm not like him? Brethren, that can hit us just as hard upside the head as that ever did that Pharisee. And you don't even sometimes realize, well, you know, I know best this, I know best that, I know this, I know that. But really, what are you doing? How, how have you deceived yourself to think that way? We recognize that doctors don't diagnose their own ailments and lawyers don't defend themselves. That is, that they're wise. Oh, there's another wonderful word besides an honest and good heart. The word wisdom. Knowing how to use the knowledge you have. That's what wisdom is. Not just knowledge. That's the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of God's the beginning of wisdom. But knowing how to use in the best way possible the knowledge that you have. If we're not honest, we'll not accept the evidence of what we are. That's what we've already labored to point out. So we are concerned that we be not a doctor who tries to doctor ourselves because we get pretty emotionally involved. That means when I start reading my Bible, am I able to read it objectively and make a right kind of application to my own life? Or is it always reading it and thinking of my brethren? Yep, that's what he or she needs to do. Yep, I can just see that in her. Yep, but you never say, what about me? These doctors and lawyers understood the need to consult another doctor or attorney who will look at the facts more objectively. In the spiritual realm, there's even greater need for us to receive help in coming to a correct understanding of ourselves. Now let me pause here before we move further and say, that's an aspect of fellowship I don't think most members of the church even understand. That the fellowship we enjoy as brothers and sisters in Christ has also to do with each one of us helping us to see the problems we've got. I never hear that emphasized in fellowship. Do you? Tell me the last time we ever heard that. Yet the Bible talks about confessing your sins one to another. It talks about every man bearing his own burden. And yet at the same time it says, bear ye one another's burdens. Now think about that for a minute. How do you do that? Especially when people won't even tell you the burden or they don't believe they got one. And they may have the biggest. Maybe self-made. In fact, a lot of our burdens are like these packs, backpacks we pick up. We put them on. And we're the only ones that can take them off. If we're not very careful, we'll make exceptions for ourselves. Rationalizing the nature of our own conduct. Because nobody can do it better than I can. But binding on others what we will not bind on ourselves. Imagine somebody, say an adult, child does something and he just blows up at that child because he didn't like what he did. And yet, if the same thing happened to his own child, he'd take a completely different position. You can see it in others, you cannot see it in yourself. When it comes to seeing our own faults, sometimes we can have some big old blind spots. And we like it that way. We hide behind those blind spots. It keep, they, they become walls of security. Talk about building walls. You either build walls to keep people out or keep people in. And folks can build walls in their minds 
as security blankets. Ultimately, what we need to do is see ourselves as God sees us. Now that means you've got to study that Bible in the proper way and you've got to be as honest as is possible for man to be. And if you don't spend much time with the Bible, studying it objectively, not to see what's wrong with everybody else, but see what's wrong with you, you're not going to benefit from the Bible as you ought to. God's way of helping us is often to send friends to show us that what pleases us to call our mistakes are sins that separate us from God just as if someone else had committed them. That's what I'm talking about an area of fellowship we never talk about. As a parent, are you a friend to your child if you don't understand what the Bible teaches your responsibility to be regarding a father or mother? Well, it doesn't work that way in God's family. You know, God had, did you know that God had a family? And if you're a Christian, you're in it. God's the Father, elder brother, Lord Jesus Christ. And we're all members in particular, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, in general, I ask, am I to help you go to heaven? And are you to help me to go to heaven? Yes. Well, what about that requires? Well, I remember an occasion with two apostles who were Christians, all interested in going to heaven, but one sinned, and the other one had to withstand him to the face because he was to be blamed. You think it was fellowship? If it wasn't fellowship, how would you describe it? Do you think Paul had in mind the well-being of Peter? Obviously, Peter understood what was going on. Peter had done the same thing to another. Remember Simon the sorcerer after he had obeyed the gospel? Remember when he desired to, by the power the apostles had, to lay hands on folks and convey a miraculous gift? Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, and he offered them money that he might receive that power. How did Peter deal with him? He said, Thy money perish with thee. For thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased. He said, I perceive that you're in the gall of bitterness, etc. Peter understood that. And later on, as Peter writes, he refers to Paul as our beloved brother Paul. I haven't found that to be a great, greatly true among a lot of brethren. If you deal with the sins they're committing, they're not open. They're not willing to say, hey, you're right. I pulled the boner. So we need to see ourselves as God sees us. And we need not to say, well, my sins are just mistakes, but your sins are sins. And then you've got, as we point out here, consider David's adultery and murder. Look what it take, took for Nathan to be his friend. Nathan... For a moment, there's best friend David had. And yet it required of Nathan to put the B on David. Thou art the man. Now when you're studying your Bible, you should be able to do that with yourself. I am the person. I am the woman. I am the man. I've already mentioned Peter's hypocrisy in Galatians 2, 11 through 14. So it comes back to the next point is love of the truth and knowing ourselves. Salvation depends on our response to the truth. At the end of this sermon, if God allows us to go through time, we will extend an invitation to anybody that wants to become a Christian or those in the church who committed sins that need to make public confession of those sins and ask the church to pray with them and for them for God to forgive them. If, if you can't make an objective, proper, scriptural examination of your life and come to a conclusion that says, I don't need to do these things, or I do need to, if you can't do that, what's the purpose of being here at all? What good does it do? Salvation depends on our response to the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. 
But the truth which must be loved does not begin and end. As important as it is. With only the plan of salvation. The church. It's work, worship and organization. Listen to me. It involves the whole truth. Including the truth about ourselves. Even our own sinful personal conduct. Of which we need to and must repent. If that is to be our home. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. You may not miss a worship service. You may know the scriptures and able to teach it concerning how to become a Christian. You're not a murderer. You're not a fornicator. You're not a liar. You just may not deal with yourself honestly. Because there are such things as secret sins. It may be that life never makes a greater demand on our courage than when we are faced with accepting some despicable fact about what we have really done, such as Cain in Genesis 4, 3 through 10. There is a great contrast between the attitudes reflected in Acts 2, verses 36 through 41, those who responded to the gospel on the day of Pentecost, and those who heard Stephen speak. In Acts 7, 54 through 60. I've contended for a long time you'll have one of three responses to the gospel. The truth will I prick you in your heart and you'll be like those people on Pentecost. You'll obey the truth when you hear it. You'll want it. You'll ask for it. Or you'll be like the people on, who heard Stephen speak. They were cut to the heart. They understood they recognized the message applied to them. They weren't about to repent, and they killed the speaker. Or you'll be like those folks in Acts chapter 17 who just come see, come saw. Well, what's the big deal? Reach the resurrection. Ah, we'll hear you again on this matter. If you can find another category to place people in who hear the gospel, I'd like for you to tell me about it. You either love the truth or you don't, you hate it. Or else just nothing really makes any difference to you. I suggest to you a third of those is killing this country. And it's killing religion. Just so what? To be honest is so important. We've got to know the truth. And we've got to want to know it more than anything else. The person who loves his preferred self-image more than the truth is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Jesus' story of the Pharisee praying in the temple, as I referred to a while ago in Luke 18, 9 through 14, shows how out of touch with reality people can be when it comes to themselves. A lot of people have mental and emotional problems because they are running from reality. They're doing their best to make the whole world fit their scope. And they rationalize everything to make it do that. Thus they can't deal with things like they ought to. Forming and keeping a healthy evaluation of our honesty and love for the truth concerning ourselves is, is very important. So here are some questions. I, there could be more put to them, uh, less, whatever. But here are some questions that can help us judge how honest we are, willing, and there's the key, willing to be about ourselves. Do we pray for help in seeing ourselves as God sees us? You'll have to jot down these passages. It won't take time to read them. Psalm 19, verses 12 through 14. Do we pray for friends who love our souls more than they love our friendship? Friends who will not let us excuse or ignore our sins, Galatians 4.16. Now you better think about that one. Because that comes down to what you think a friend really is. Do we pray to be put into circumstances and situations that will make us see our true character? Remembering the trying of Abraham's faith, Genesis 22. That whole thing was about Abraham understanding himself. 
You not realize that? God's a omniscient. He, he knows all. Well, then who was the trying of Abraham's faith good for? It's Abraham. And so it is when we face whatever there is in life. We prove ourselves. Will we solve the problem according to God's will or will we do it as it suits us? Do we pray for our secrets to be exposed and would we be glad for the honesty this forces upon us? I'm not talking about exposed everybody else. I'm talking about exposed ourselves. What? You mean I can hide things from myself? You sure can. You can justify yourself in your own eyes better than by anybody I know of. Do we pray for every fault which we have hidden from ourselves to be brought out into the open light of truth? John chapter 3, 19 through 21. What is your purpose for Bible study? You remember James talking about the man who beholds himself in a mirror and seeth what manner of person he is and then doesn't do a thing about it. He goes on. That's what James is saying, folks. He's talking about the man's lack of honesty and objectivity. And lo and behold, it's then we come to James 1 verse 25, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Who's going to be blessed in his deed? The fellow looks in the mirror and sees himself, the mirror of God's word in this case, sees himself what he is, and straightway, because he doesn't like what he sees, he didn't do anything about it. He's not going to be blessed in his deed. Now you can look at the perfect law of liberty and what you do, as I said earlier, you see yourself, but you're seeing the reflection of all these other people behind you and you choose to concentrate on those folks behind you rather than you. Do we pray for help in accepting even the most painful truth so we can change our ways? Christianity is about changing our ways. That's what repentance means. Now these that I say are just some questions. Questions like these tend to make us truly uncomfortable. We don't like things that make us uncomfortable. We just don't. But we better learn to be uncomfortable with ourselves when the truth hits us squarely between the eyes that we're not in harmony with it and then do what other truths teach us in the Bible to repent of that, then we'll have peace of mind. Then the conscience won't bother us. Truth very often has the effect of making us feel uncomfortable. That's what it did in Acts 2.37. They were pricked in their heart. They were uncomfortable. You try sitting on a pen and see if you'll be very comfortable. Well, their heart was pricked. But at least they were honest enough to do the right thing and ask for God's remedy and they were willing to apply it. Now God knows all of us perfectly. There's nothing hidden. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. Nothing hidden. So we have to ask, do we genuinely love His objective truth? Do we love it enough to seek the help of others in learning the truth about sins of which we need to repent? Do we approach our friends that should be our brothers and sisters in Christ because they're here to help us go to heaven? I think that in a home where husband and wife are both Christians, they've got to remember that makes them brothers and sisters in Christ. And they have every obligation that any brother or sister in Christ has to one another. Wives sure can't help their husbands see what a nutcase he is or help the wife, the husband, if he's what he ought to be, see where she's not being what she ought to be. How else do you help each other go to heaven if you don't do that? And when you sit there with your mouth sealed as if it's already sewed up and ready for burial, how are you being what God says you ought to be? 
Don't tell me you love one another when you don't love people enough to help them see their sins. Oh, we have a wonderful marriage. Oh, you do? Yeah, we don't ever deal with each other's problems. That's a marriage? That's how you grow in marriage? That's how you love one another? And especially when it comes down to S-I-N, sin. Well, that's what he wants to do, so I'm here to support him. No, you're not. Not when he sins. And you're not to support her when she sins. You're not to support your children when they sin. And the children, when they get old enough, aren't to support the parents when they sin. If they're all members of the church, your brothers and sisters in Christ, they ought to be like Peter and Paul when Paul had to withstand Peter to the face. Or Peter said what he did to the former Simon the sorcerer. Now that's love. Or when Nathan had to say to David, Thou art the man. But that's not the way the world thinks. And too often the thinking of the world is in the mind of Christians. What about the elders of the church? Do you think they have any sense at all? Well, if they're qualified and appointed to be elders, evidently they do, whether you believe it or not. They have an obligation to perform. They're serious. They're faithful to God. They've got to realize that they have to give an account to every member of the church they oversee. Yep. Very concerned. How is it you can read in your own Bible, unless you do it like we said earlier, the qualifications of elders, and see men who meet those qualifications, and who are trying to do the work the Bible says shepherds ought to do, but you're a pain in the neck to them, rather than encouragement and helpful to them. Some people need to know about the cooperative spirit and learn there is such a thing. Hebrews 13, 17 is going to read on the day of judgment. Same way it reads now. And mean then just exactly what it means now. May we never turn away from the truth about ourselves. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. I remember back as a young preacher. I was still in college. Just trying to get started. I had a habit because nobody ever told me. And you know how you pick up words, slang words. It was not anything that uh, was foul language or anything like that. It was just a slang term I grew up with. I remember saying it one time around him. He said, come here, I'll talk to you. Now, see, the thing I should have done if I would follow the example of some of my brethren, when he told me about, now, you don't, you don't need to be saying that. So just be thinking about it. So it's not a bad thing, but you just don't need to have those things. They're not exemplary of a Christian, especially one who wants to teach. See, what I should have done is bow my neck and look at him and said, who are you tell me what to do? Now, I would have just played the Christian spirit. I would have shown him how much I really was right. All too often that's the case. And there's not a thing. Here's the sad part about it. I'm learning. I learned a long time ago this would be the case. I just don't like to admit it. But I have to be honest with reality. Some people you can help. Some people you can't. And the quicker you can learn that about folks, the better off you'll be. People you can help will prove it by their actions. People you can't help will prove it by their actions. May God give us brethren who will gently help us come to our senses. Sometimes it may be more than gently, as Paul to Peter. Before them all, this was a public gathering when he did this. Brethren, heaven is too important for me to keep your friendship by withholding the truth. I started out a long time ago, not, I'm just not going to do that. Just not going to do it. Because the greatest friendship I can have is be friends with God. And I know what James 2 says about how to be friends with God. And use Abraham as the example. When Abraham's faith was tried, he called, God called him his friend. We've got to be honest with ourselves. And therefore truly honest with God before it's too late. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14 makes it very clear. He's going to bring everything into judgment with every secret thing. So why, why in our individual study of the Bible, why do we always try to act 
and some sort of driving a peg down here and I dare you to well it'd be better said this way put a chip on my shoulder I dare you to knock it off is that the way you live? doesn't make sense so summing it all up are you honest of heart? are you really honest? Do you receive all the truth bearing on a situation objectively and able to apply it to yourself rather than everybody else? Do you count your brothers and sisters, your best friends, even when a Nathan has to come and say, Thou art the man? Or when he does, ah, you're no longer my friend. I suggest you better strongly, I don't care how few people in the church do it, consider all that is entailed in the biblical doctrine of fellowship and brethren helping each other and what's involved in going to heaven. It's more than simply getting together, singing songs, having prayer, reading the Bible, eating something, or whatever. It has to do with me doing what is my obligation with you to help you be godly and the same thing with you toward me. And if I've got it all set up to where everything is going to be seen, not in the light of the perfect law of liberty, but for my colored spectacles, things won't bode well with me. And I am planning a future for myself, even in this life, that's going to come back to haunt me like nobody's business even when brethren who love you and care for you are trying to turn you from the way you're going. But it still comes all down to this. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Because we're free moral agents. And you've got to decide that. You've got to decide whether you apply the truth to your life, let come what may, and no matter the sacrifices. Or you're going to continue to deceive yourself, to see yourself as you like to see yourself, and judge everybody else a lot of the same thing. And most of the time that puts everybody else down and you on the pedestal. Don't let it be that way because there's nothing in the Bible that points that attitude. Now, are you a child of God? You can't be unless you believe from the scriptures that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. The Lord will then add you to the church and in that church you can grow and develop if you will. By keeping an honest and good heart and examining yourself objectively in the light of the right and divided word. You need to repent. We've studied what to do. It's God's second law of part. Now where do you stand before God? Are you able honestly and objectively to answer that question? Are you going to color it? So really you stand just fine. No matter the error in your life. Only you can answer all those things. God already knows. We're not trying to get God to heaven. He's trying to get us to heaven in the only way possible through the gospel, which is His power to save us. And it can't work, folks, if you're not honest with yourself and willing to objectively study it and then let it prick you in your heart and then do what you know is right regardless of what's required in changing your life, of course. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.